So you guys absolutely loved my last video on these HDMI over IP extenders. And I got literally hundreds of questions. So me and Sherlock the Cat are going to spend some time today answering those questions for you. Let's get started. Question number one, will it do 4K? No, it does 1080p, 60 hertz. Question two, will it do 4K, 144 hertz? No, it won't. Does it support ultra wide resolutions? This answer actually was fun. I spent some time testing different resolutions on the transmitter and the receiver. What I've concluded is that the transmitter and the receiver negotiate their resolution separately. The transmitter gives the HDMI source a list of resolutions it supports between 800 by 600 and 1920 by 1080. The receiver will separately negotiate a resolution with the TV, preferring 1920 by 1080. So when I set my computer to 800 by 600, the display on the remote side is still thinking it's getting a 1920 by 1080 signal, and it's got black bars on the side because that's a 4-3 aspect ratio. I don't have any 4-3 monitors to test, and I don't even have any monitors that support 720p. All I have are displays that do 1080p. So I couldn't test with lower resolution displays. I do have monitors that support higher resolutions, and in all cases they negotiated 1920 by 1080 not anything higher. What type of encoding does it use? Or can I open it in VLC? The answer, I don't know. I tried to open it in VLC and it was not obvious what encoding it was using. If you'd like to have a go at it, I've included some PCAP files on my blog. Link down in the description below. How does it support HDCP? I don't have a ton of good ways to diagnose this. I know that when I was connecting my TiVo, it was able to negotiate HDCP 1.x, not sure entirely which version, and protected content from the TiVo would play correctly in all of my displays. None of my displays would tell me in their information settings if they had negotiated HDCP or not, so I'm not sure if it's either stripping the HDCP or passing it on to the display or separately negotiating HDCP with the display and the source. And I don't honestly have a lot of devices that do HDC, that require HDCP protection to test this with. What about NDI or other professional video over IP solutions? They exist. NDI in particular does not have a method for making a matrix over IP using switches. There's always some sort of software involved that does video mixing. Other solutions I found basically don't list a price. And if you have to ask, they're probably too expensive for home users. Another little quirk I noticed while doing testing for this follow-up is that the receiver never goes to sleep. This is what you get when the receiver hasn't found a transmitter or there's no transmitter transmitting. And it stays like this forever. So in this case, the computer went to sleep. The transmitter doesn't get a video input. The receiver shows this. So the monitor never goes to sleep. If you're using TVs, they don't go to sleep anyway, but if you're using computer monitors, you gotta turn them off yourself. How about them compression artifacts? How bad are they? Honestly, they're really not bad. Me and Sherlock spent some time here watching Big Buck Bunny and Sintel, both from the Blender Foundation, Creative Commons licensed. I stared very hard at the screen and we could find compression artifacts, but they were not very noticeable. Um, in Big Buck Bunny, for example, there were some blades of grass that would blur a bit and then suddenly turn clear. And I think that's related to the iframe interval. So however they've configured the codec, they're using a relatively long iframe interval to get the bandwidth down, which makes sense. And sometimes during scene changes, the first few frames after a scene change, it won't generate a new iframe is what it seems to be happening. I can't really confirm that, but that's what it looks like to me. If you're just using this for your desktop computer or other non super high quality things this will probably be fine if you're doing gaming on it again it'll probably be perfectly fine you probably won't be able to tell the difference does it work over wi-fi does it work over power line extenders does it work over mocha coax i don't have any of these devices to test with but in theory it should work with anything that can bridge ip traffic not route so as long as all of the devices are on the same layer 2 subnet so they're not being routed, they're being bridged. It should work fine. If you have tried this with a Wi-Fi extender or a power line adapter or a Mocha adapter, feel free to write down in the comments 
and I will update a pinned comment explaining that it was successful. So this whole time I've been talking to you, one of these displays is connected directly to my test computer, and the other one is connected through the extenders. This is my test system, I use it in a lot of videos, and it's running Ubuntu Linux, and it has two of the display outputs mirrored to each other, so they're showing the same thing. I'm not using an HDMI splitter because I don't have one, but I did time the two displays to make sure they are within a frame of each other using my iPhone high-speed camera and the Blur Blusters flicker test. I have the extenders connected through an Ethernet switch, which does support IGMP snooping, and this display in particular is the one that's connected to the HDMI extenders. I then took high-speed video of the full-screen flicker test, and that showed that, on average, the remote display is roughly four frames behind. So take that how you will, but essentially that's the number I came up with for latency. What happens if I connect two keyboards, two mice, to the same transmitter? Do they both work? So I got the keyboard I've been using, which is connected to the transmitter connected to the monitor, and I have a second receiver just connected to a keyboard, but they're all tuned to ID number one. So here, you can get out of stuff, use the mouse, back into it. Using the other keyboard, you can use this mouse, you can use this mouse, they both work. What if I use both mice at the same time? So I'm going to click on this mouse and then drag with this mouse. Didn't really like that. So I can click with this mouse and drag with this mouse, but if I click with this mouse and I move the other mouse, it releases the click. So it seems like both mice will work, but if you're moving both of them, only one of them will get sent at a time. How about keyboards? Typing on both keyboards shows up. Holding shift on one keyboard and pressing a key on the other does not give me a capital letter. So it seems like, like the mice, it's taking the scan codes from one keyboard and the scan codes from the other and sending them, but not mixing them together into a single keyboard. Some of you guys asked about power over ethernet, which these do not support. I honestly don't exactly understand the desire for PoE because you're always gonna be connecting these to some other device that's probably going to need a lot more power. So if you're connecting a receiver to a television, there's a really good chance the television's gonna need power. So power over ethernet for this isn't really gonna help you there. Same on the transmitter side. You're probably connecting it to a source that's gonna consume more power than PoE can supply anyway. That said, if you really wanna do PoE, I have a link down in the description to a TP-Link PoE splitter that I have used before that works very well and is quite cheap. Also on the subject of power, I made a comment in the last video on how you could probably power these over USB since they only need 5 volts and they have a really standard barrel jack. If you buy an adapter cable, you can probably plug it into the USB port on your TV, your computer, or whatever you're using. And there was some flack in the comments because the power bricks these things come with are rated for 5 volts at 2 amps, which is quite a bit more than USB can supply. So we're going to measure the power consumption here. Now, I don't have a USB power meter but I do have a kilowatt, so we're gonna measure the AC power going into the wall brick. And if it's less than two and a half watts, then it's within the USB spec, 500 milliamps at five volts. So as you can see here, the receiver is drawing 1.3 to 1.4 watts while playing a video. That is well under the limit that USB can provide, so you should be perfectly fine using USB power for this. The transmitter is a bit higher at two watts, but that should still be fine for USB power. You want to plug it into your computer's USB port. So hopefully that answers more of your questions about these things. I've been happy with them for my use cases. I appreciate that they're not for every use case, but they're pretty simple. They're not terribly expensive, and I've used them in a whole bunch of different situations so far like I explained in the last video. Once again, if you liked this video, I have a link to the blog post, which is actually the same blog post as the last video. I also have a link to the last video if you didn't see that one. I have a Discord community you're welcome to follow me on. I have the PCAP files I promised I'd provide there in the blog post. You can download them there if you want to try to decode these things. And as always, I'll see you on the next adventure.
Oh, 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 I'm sorry. What the heck are you doing under my feet?